Welcome aboard, Captain. First Mate Kinty's voice boomed across the deck, his weather-beaten face breaking into a grin. We're near ready to cast off, just waiting on your word. Our cargo secured, Gaon replied as he walked past the bare-chested sailor. All set, sir, Kinty replied, gesturing towards the hold. This cargo's pretty light, mostly clothes. I reckon we'll make fine time, wind-willing. Make it happen, Mr. Kinty. I'll be in my cabin. Gion instinctively adjusted his faded captain's hat. Aye, sir. Before you go, one of the mage's guards came by with a package for you. Oh, the captain paused, looking at the wood box that his first mate pointed to. Oh, he carefully lifted it with both hands, no telling what could be in it, best handled cautiously. Aye, take us out, but keep the shore in sight. I don't like the look of the clouds in the east. We might be in for a storm. Gaon crossed the open deck of his ship towards his cabin. The sailor nodded crisply and started with the orders to cast off the lines and ready the sails. Captain Gion kicked his cabin door shut behind him. He could still hear his men shouting orders and running up and down the deck. He gently set the box down on top of the charts he'd left out on his desk. I hadn't gotten a gift in the last five years, and now two in as many days. Strange times, or just a strange place. He looked at the box. It was equal parts stressful and flattering. It was far from normal for lords of the realm to notice a commoner, even one with a ship. He stared at the box. It was well made, smooth and shiny. It's big. It could be full of almost anything. There could be money, jewels, or poisonous snakes. Oh, right, he's a mage, so some fireball or other arcane trap could be there, too. He shut his eyes and listened. The ship rocked side to side as it came about. He waited for the sails to catch the wind. The hull shuddered, the lines groaned, and they were underway. Gaon walked around the desk, staring at the box. There's no hope for me if I turn timid now. He pulled his hip dagger and used the tip to slowly open the hinged box, his ears straining to hear clicks, hisses, or the moaning of undead squirrels. The lid revealed a wooden jug and two wooden cups covered in embroidered cloth. There was a folded note, too. He removed them and set them down on his desk. All of them were a fair bit heavier than he expected. The cup with the raspberry motifs carved into it was filled with what appeared to be fresh raspberries. The other cup had some ornate leaves and held what smelled like a bundle of fresh mint. The jug, however, held a small leather-bound notebook and a new graphite stylus tied to it with a ribbon. Doubtlessly a reminder of his promise to the mage, not that one was needed. It remained to be determined what kind of reminder he'd been sent. He wished he knew more about the man. After an afternoon of polite conversations with townsfolk, all he'd gleaned was that the mage had appeared with the morning dew just a few months ago, bringing prosperity and security. Consolidating that much loyalty and wealth in a quarter year was unimaginably fast, suspiciously so. No one even knew where he was from. They'd sailed in from Jagged Cove, but most of the ships in the Empire do. Even if he were from the capital, the city was so sprawling that it wouldn't remotely narrow things down, as helpful as telling a hunter to look for deer outside. He opened the folded note. Its lack of seal was a bit notable, although he couldn't really say what that told him. In neat, spidery cursive, the page read, Sea Captain Jayon. Thank you again for your assistance. I hope you and your crew like refreshing berry water as much as my militia does. Safe travels, Mage Grigory Petrov Thippily. Hmm, he seemed the sincere type, and the fact he was spending time with his men at all probably meant it was sincere interest there and here. But I can't rule out some advanced type of evil or cruelty. It's all too far from anything I've seen, and I've seen plenty of evil. He left his cabin and found his first mate at the wheel. They were at sea and underway with the shore still close enough to see birds on the tree branches, but plenty deep for the whale's keel. Once they rounded the point, he'd order them into deeper waters. Mr. Kinty, report. Underway. All men and cargo accounted for, Captain. 
Grand, fetch me that new sailor, the one we picked up in Seven Hills last winter, and bring him into my cabin. Sir, he's a bit dim. You sure he's who you want? Suspicion creased the mate's ruddy face. Bring him. Gaon returned to his cabin and filled the jug with water from his personal cask. To his surprise, the empty jug was still heavier than he'd expected, even with the notebook removed. He saw a flat river rock, covered in spidery, runic symbols affixed to the inside bottom of the jug, cold to the touch. That's obviously something. He sniffed it. It just smelled of oils and wood. The mate and sailor entered and stood awkwardly in the gently swaying cabin. Ah, there you are, Gaon's voice warmed as he addressed the sailor. I've been meaning to commend you on your recent work. You've really impressed me. He reached for his personal copper cup, a thin, well-worn vessel. While in town I came across some enchanted water. I'd like you to have the honour of the first taste. Jeon muddled a handful of berries and fresh mint leaves in the cup, his eyes fixed intently on the stream of water as he poured slowly from the jug, watching for any unusual behaviour in the liquid. Oh, thank you, Captain. I'm a-trying so hard. Sailing's fiercely complex, the man said, his words slow and thick. The captain passed the cold metal cup to the man and smiled calmly. I reckon it makes your successes all the grander. Tell me, how is it? The man drank eagerly. Oh, so good, Captain. Cold and flavorful. Best thing I ever drunk, mebby. The sailor staggered forward, slammed the mostly empty cup on the desk, and grabbed his throat. He loudly gasped and doubled over. The two older men backed away, watching but making no motion to help. Gack! Ack! Ahem, sorry, Captain. There was a berry in there. I near choked on it. He reached forward, grabbed the cup, and finished it in a single motion. The captain raised his eyebrows expectantly, but the sailor just licked his lips. Ahem, thank you again, sir. It was icy cold. How did you make it so cold in the summer? His eyes were still watering from choking on the raspberry. It was actually enchanted water, that would be all. You're dismissed. Keep up the good work. Jayon gestured for his first mate to stay. He continued once they were alone. Keep an eye on him. Tell me if he keels over or turns into a goat. That will be all, Kinty. Jayon's mind raced, weighing the possibilities. Killing me makes no sense, but sanity isn't exactly a mage's hallmark. Did I offend him somehow? Say the wrong thing? Or worse, not say something I should have? He eyed the jug warily. If it's genuine, it's an extravagant gift, far too generous for a mere acquaintance, let alone one who's been impertinent. The captain's fingers drummed on his desk. I could just toss it overboard, chalk it up to caution, and never darken that town's shores again. But another thought nagged at him. Or it could be exactly what it seems. He sighed, decision made. I'll give it a day. If that oaf doesn't sprout horns or start bleating, maybe, just maybe, I've found myself a patron. A wry smile tugged at his lips. And that would be worth far more than any enchanted jug. He rose from his desk and clicked his door locked. The iron mechanism was imported and had cost him a fortune, but privacy was priceless. He opened a hidden panel in the wall of his cabin, revealing a small idol carved of orca bone. It was a leviathan, with the body and pincers of a crab, the tail of a shark, and two long octopus tentacles. More specifically, it was Zoth Kormog, the primarch of all leviathans, as old as the seas themselves, and held to be the true god of the world's oceans by people of Geon's faith. He opened an old stone jar and gently dabbed some powdered mother-of-pearl onto his fingertip and rubbed it into the idol's shell. He closed his eyes and whispered, Zoth Kormog of foam and brine, shield this ship and crew of mine. Zoth Kormog, depths and tide, be my strength, my unseen guide. Jayon resealed the jar and wiped his hands clean on a towel. With a purified heart, he closed his hidden shrine and emerged onto the deck. There was much to do, and he hoped that his duties as captain would distract him.
He never wanted to be pulled into a viper's nest of politics. With the wind out of the north, they'd have to tack to Wavegate. If the weather held, it should still only be about two days. What am I even stressing about? I have the most valuable trade route in the history of my career, and I still have my ship, my men, and a hold of excellent goods. I should be celebrating, not planning my own funeral. It's fine, sir. It's just a cough, Roz protested. But he immediately undermined his words with another racking fit. Bullshit. You've caught some whole plague from that hole. Get yourself up to the medic. She can see to you. I ain't letting you get the rest of us sick. Can you even see straight? Your eyes are deeply red. Ricard, take him upstairs. I think I saw her on the rooftop, Stanisk said. His eyes carried genuine concern despite his harsh words. The rest of the men at the table stared at him uncomfortably. Roz stood started to say something before doubling over into another bout of raw coughing. Hey now, don't get your plague all over me. Come on, let's get up the stairs, Rickard said, pushing away from his barely touched lunch. He grabbed a linen napkin off the table and passed it to Roz as the young man had dropped his. Rickard raised his eyebrows at the amount of blood on it. Let's go, how are you so filthy? They took the stairs slowly, as Roz had to stop a few times to catch his breath, his wheezing uncomfortably ragged. He croaked. Maybe it's the moon lung. The mage cures. His coughs stopped his chain of thought, and he slowly marched up to the rooftop with grim determination, Rickard's arm around him for support. Teresa rose to her feet when she saw the two of them emerge from the stairwell and onto the rooftop. What happened? He's so pale. Chief thinks it's some whole plague from the mine. I ain't got a better theory, Rickard said, easing his comrade into a chair. I'm fine. It's just Roz started but couldn't finish. His coughs were wet and sounded painful. Teresa examined him, checking his eyes and lips and nose. What happened? Your skin is clammy and your lips are a bit blue. This isn't anything I've seen. In a low, slow rasp, so as not to trigger any more coughing, Roz said, I think it's just some of the air in the mine. It's a bit dusty and smoky down there. By now, Grigory had noticed the disruption and had put down his book and crossed the roof to look at the situation. He's got a ragged cough and signs of suffocation, but he looks mostly okay. What could it be? the medic asked the master demonologist. Grigory pursed his lips and checked him over, first visually, then with a magical gesture. Most concerning of all was Roz's lack of reaction to the mage's inspection, just slow, reedy breaths. Hmm, the good news is, you'll be fine. The bad news is, you're going to have to take a day or two of rest. I guess sitting in the sun isn't especially bad news. There isn't much I can do for you. He turned to his apprentice. He must have cleaned himself up a bit after he left the mines, but this is a combination of dust and smoke inhalation. The most severe I've seen, to be honest, including people fleeing forest fires or burning homes. Turning back to the pale soldier, you surely must have had problems breathing before it got this bad. Why did you stay? A weak smile. Orders, sir. The mage sighed both reasonable and infuriating. In the future, if your orders take you to a place that is killing you, we'll all understand if you reposition or ask for clarification. Never mind that. You did well, and your dedication is commendable. I really should have examined the mine. It's just I had so much to attend to. Teresa, would you care to accompany me? She looked at Roz and shook her head. I should stay here, make sure he's comfy. If that's okay, is there anything we can do? No, he should be okay. If he gets worse, we can probably heat up some liquid oxygen from the cryo kilns, but that probably won't come up. I'll form a minor regeneration spell for his lungs later on today, and that should prevent scarring or long-term damage. Nothing we do now will help him much, but he should recover pretty quickly. It's a nice morning, so I'd say let him sit out in the fresh air. Okay, Ricard. If you don't mind accompanying me to my quarters, I'd appreciate an escort into the mine. I'm not sure what to expect. 
Rickard glanced at Ross's pale form, then back at the mage, his brow furrowed with concern. With respect, sir, both of us staying topside seems the wiser choice. We don't know what's down there. The mage's eyes lit up, a mischievous grin spreading across his face. Ah, but Rickard, safety never unearthed great discoveries. He clapped his hands together, practically bouncing with excitement. Fear not, our detour to my chambers is precisely to ensure our well-being. We'll craft protection for our faces and eyes. Now, onward to discovery. As they entered his study, dozens of imps sat cross-legged on the tables. The mage's voice rang out, commanding his idle minions. Imps, craft two sack hoods, each with a pocket of loose wool to cover the mouth. Merp! A chorus of high-pitched voices responded as they sprang into action. They scurried across the room, a whirlwind of tiny red bodies darting between the workbenches that lined the back of the chamber. These stations were cluttered with half-finished inventions and mystical apparatus. The mage continued, stroking his chin thoughtfully. You know, I'm not entirely sure how dwarf physiology handles these airborne particles. Those thick beards must serve some purpose, but they're mammals like us. If it affected Ros so severely in mere days, it can't be good for them either. Rickard offered a non-committal shrug, watching the darty imps. Undeterred by his guard's reticence, the mage pressed on. We'll descend properly masked and inspect their work areas. I'm certain I can devise some improvements, perhaps a water sprayer or a type of filter cloth. His eyes gleamed with the prospect of new inventions. Imps, seal the eye holes with thin mica sheets. Merp! Merp! The imps chirped in affirmation, putting the finishing touches on their creations. With a flourish, they presented the completed hoods and sat cross-legged on the work table. The hoods even had leather drawstrings for a snug fit. Grigory held the cloth hood to the light by the window. Given a few more attempts, I can do better, but this'll suffice. Let's go. The mage tossed one of the hoods to his guard, and they headed down the stairs, through the gatehouse, and along the path to the mine. In the three weeks since their arrival, the scene had transformed dramatically. Nearby vegetation had vanished or been crushed into the mud. Three abandoned carts dotted the area, and a small pile of broken stone lay near the entrance. As they pushed into the shack, they froze in their tracks. I forgot how dim they like it. Gregory felt along the edge of the wall for the basket of mage lights he knew were there. Coming from the bright morning, it was total darkness, but slowly his eyes started to adjust. Where there used to be a small rise of stone was now a deep black pit. With a click, Grigory activated the mage light, tuned its brightness to be useful to them without hurting dwarf eyes, then passed it to Rickard and grabbed another for himself. The ramp down spiralled steeply, and as he shone the light off the edge, he could see the opposite wall but not the bottom. The air grew thick with the pungent smell of wood smoke and rock dust. They paused to don their hastily fashioned masks, though the shifting eye holes and imperfect transparency severely impaired their vision. Makes it a little tougher to see. Watch the edge, Grigory said, a wholly unneeded thing to point out, as it had no railing, and neither man knew how deep it went. His voice sounded distant and muffled through the wool. A slow and timid descent later, they found the bottom. As they arrived at a flat landing, the mage reckoned they were perhaps four stories below ground. At this level, they could finally hear the high-pitched speech of the dwarfs ahead, along with the echoing racket of dwarf steel striking rock. With a sigh, Grigory continued. The passage was straight, with a noticeable slope down. The problem he ran into was that the tunnel was dug for dwarfs, so he had to bend over double. He appreciated that even this height would have meant clearing stone over their heads, a kindness that he doubted human miners would have done. 
Soon they emerged into a more open chamber, finally enough room for them to stand mostly upright. By now their eyes adapted to the darkness, and they could see dwarfs trundling around, almost all with tools, as they cut stone, dragged low sleds, and loaded carts with different grades and types of stones. He knew that all fifty of them must be here somewhere, but only saw a dozen or so. Upon seeing the two humans, the closest dwarfs dropped what they were doing and backed off. Their squeaking grew intense, and soon all of them stopped doing what they were doing. The taller Tradeklan dwarf came out from around a corner, and the smaller Digklan dwarfs backed away to give them space. Mzgurdsky, we didn't expect you. Welcome to our new underhome. It's small and shallow, but we dig. I see. You've exceeded my expectations. I see how much stone comes out of here, but this is so deep. Truly none equal your mastery of mining. I was mainly worried about how you are doing. The man I sent to help you is very sick from the dust and smoke. Grigory spoke, his voice muffled, though he couldn't tell if it was because of the mask on his face or the thick, dust-laden air. His mage light pierced the darkness like a spear into murky water, so dense was the dust in the air. It was remarkable that Roz lasted as long as he did, not to mention the resilience of the dwarfs themselves. Your kindness glows. We dig for unity. Your guard clan man had much trouble. Dwarfs breathe dust. To his credit, he seemed in no way uncomfortable in the depths, which made sense. This is how they lived in the depths that the Dig Clan dug. Would you mind giving me a tour? This is far more extensive than I expected. Grigori smiled, not that anyone could tell through his sack hood. Yes, yes, our work is our pride. We labor for you also. Come, come. Kirkip, the Tradeklandorf said. He made a sweeping bow and pointed further down. The passage was rough and unfinished, but smoother than the mage would have expected. From the central spot, there were passages in the four cardinal directions. The spiral ramp had made him lose his bearings, but he assumed the dwarfs would have a way to work it out. Left and right went mostly flat, while forward went down, and the way back to the surface was behind him. How is it so smoky? I gave you smokeless mage lights. What's burning? he asked. For mining. The stone is hard, so we heat it, then we wet it. Fire setting makes stone is flaky and soft. Only needed sometimes, and can't get good stone blocks with fire, but fastest way clearing, Kirkip said. He even pointed to scorch marks on the ceiling and walls. With the limited visibility in his sack hood, he couldn't really see much detail, but it seemed to back up what he said. Wait, isn't that incredibly dangerous? What if you hit some dangerous gases, or just use all the air? You could have suffocated down here, to say nothing of the smoke, Grigory said, his hidden eyes wide with alarm. Many dangers of the deeps. Digdorfs die doing burns, but not often. A price worth paying for progress. They dig with skill, dangers are managed. The trade clan dwarf pointed around a corner where the smoke was so thick it stung even through the mask. With watering eyes, he could see the embers of a fire still burning. They had stacked wood up and leaned it against the rock face. The fire was mostly burnt out now. The heat radiating back was intense. Since he couldn't really see anyways, he closed his eyes. Oof! How is your face okay down here? His hurts, but mining is important. For unity. The Tradeclan Dorf used that word again as a way of justification for everything. As he spoke, he gently pushed the mage a few steps back. Watch now, you are just in time for the shatter. Soft boots pattered on rough stone as dwarfs with sloshing buckets of water lined up near the burnt wall. The first dwarf in line held a wooden shield and crouched low, while the one behind splashed the water over it and against the stone wall. The water flashed to steam, and hot shards of stone snapped and flew, several smashing into the shield, and the rest shattered harmlessly against the sides of the cavern. The dwarfs in line passed forward buckets to the tosser, and while the stone made strange moans and snaps, it was less energetic than the first bucket. Soon hot, sooty water flowed at Grigory's feet. 
Much success. No one was hurt. The cracks run deep. Dorf ears can tell, Kukip explained. The trade clanner spoke in Dorfish to the Digclan boss. After a brief back and forth, they seemed to come to an agreement. Several Digclan Dorfs hurried away, soon returning with a minecart. Unlike normal minecarts designed to carry stone, this cart was a single large machine. They pushed it down the smoky hallway and spent some time locking it into place with deployable legs that hooked onto small spikes the dwarfs drove into the cavern floor. Grigory wished he could see better. The cooling smoke had started to cling to the eye panels, sticky and black. The mage wiped them with his thumb as he tried to make sense of what was happening. The dwarves deployed two long handles, one on each side of the device. With synchronized movements, they began to crank, the ratcheting sound echoing as they wound the coiled steel spring tighter. Chuck, 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 bam. Somehow the spring was released and sent the heavy steel chisel forward, slamming into the cooling rock face. The impact shattered the wall further, leaving a smooth mark. They re-aimed it and started cranking it again. Oh, that machine. It's positively brilliant. That's the answer. That's how you can do so much mining. By concentrating strength into a single point and a single instant. Can you change the striking head? Are there bigger versions? Oh, does the angle of impact affect the strike? Grigory blinked away sooty tears, trying desperately to get a better look at the dwarfs and their machine. Ha! You are dwarf at heart, yes to all things, and more. Back at Hive, they use grand spring strikers, a dozen dwarfs draw, and smash any stone. We only brought smalones for small works. The dwarf beamed with pride. Talking about dwarfish excellence clearly excited it. Oh, would it be possible for me to have a look at one of your spring strikers? I'd love to examine it in my chambers, just for a day or two. You'll have it back after. Grigory felt a headache forming. This mine was no place for men. His hive secret, no. Secret. Can't letting uplanders examine secrets. The dwarf paused, obviously conflicted. But Mzguzgi is hive friend, not outsider. Will improve tool with magicka? That's precisely what I'd like to do. There is much potential here, and I may be able to help you along. My discipline isn't engineering specifically, but I have ideas. Grigory looked up from the machine and was swept by a wave of vertigo and confusion. In this dark, cramped space, he actually had no idea where the exit was anymore, and he fought back the welling panic. Okay, one machine, for three days. Kirkip turned to the Digclan boss and spoke quickly in Dorfish. They appeared to argue, the fast hissing squeaks getting louder and faster. Other Digclan dwarfs backed away uncomfortably. Grigory stood up, hitting the back of his head on the rough stone above him. Bah, this place is awful. How did Roz endure for entire days down here? The Tradeclan Dwarf shook his head. No three days. You can have until morning only. Tool is needed for mining. Splendid. Show me which one I can take and I'll be on my way. Rickard, give me a hand and we'll return to the realm of surface folk. The two humans, along with a few Dig Clan dwarfs, pushed the wooden wheeled minecart up the steep ramps and out of the mine. As soon as they emerged from the entry shed, they tore their masks off their faces, greedily gulping fresh air. Both leaned heavily on the cart, their hair plastered to their foreheads with sweat from the exertion. So glad to be out. That place was so hot, sir, and so hard to breathe. How do the dwarfs do it? I can't imagine. Ricard gasped, his breath coming in ragged bursts. I... I... don't know, Grigory replied, panting. He glanced down at his sweat-soaked, soot-stained clothes with a frown. These might be a total loss. There are limits to what even an imp can clean. Grigory shook his head, trying to clear the splitting headache that had formed. Their beards, their eyelids, and their lungs are all different from ours. They thrive in that sort of place, though I can't imagine it's healthy, even for them. He winced, the pain sharp behind his eyes. They mentioned wanting tools to measure the air composition. 
If they're fine with that little oxygen, I can't imagine what something too dangerous for a dwarf would look like. Grigory nodded, wiping his sooty hand across his brow. All right, lad, I've got my breath back. Let's get this thing into my quarters. I am excited to see how it works.